Even unconscious, the anxiety produced by oxygen deprivation is significant. I had been an EMT for 10 years, so I understood much of what was happening. His longtime physician came to speak to my dad's wife and me and told us how much he cared about my dad and that if it was his own father, he would let him go. We agreed. Over the next six hours or so, until his death, his physician ordered certain drugs to be administered so that dad would die in complete and total comfort. Most of the pain meds, or anti-anxiety drugs, slow respirations, and as respirations are slowed, metabolizing of added prescribed drugs also slows down. Eventually, respirations cease, as does the heartbeat. The effects of the medication assisted my father's imminent death, his dying. I forgot my water bottle. <laughs> by defining its terms in order to minimize misunderstanding. So let me begin with the definition or the meaning of euthanasia. The original Greek, eu plus santos, combined to mean a good death. Until the Third Reich's misappropriation of the term, euthanasia was understood as a good, gentle, or peaceful death. Euthanasia is generally spoken of as being either active or passive. Passive euthanasia is the stopping of life-sustaining treatments such as blood transfusions, chemotherapy, IV infusions, and the like. It is thought of as allowing someone to die. In passive euthanasia, the patient dies from the underlying disease and not from intervention by the physician. On the other hand, active euthanasia is considered an intentional hastening of imminent death according to that person's wishes or not. It is characterized often as killing. Active euthanasia can be chosen or unchosen and traditionally has been viewed as immoral whether done directly by the physician as a mercy killing or by the patient herself or himself with the help of the physician as in Oregon's death with dignity. It is relatively clear when euthanasia is voluntary and chosen, either by direction from the patient herself or himself to the attending physician, spouse, or family members, or through an advanced directive. The patient requests the easing of death by way of physician prescribed medications. Unchosen active euthanasia is quite different. Unchosen active euthanasia can be either non-voluntary or involuntary. Non-voluntary active euthanasia can occur, for example, involving comatose patients who have not expressed explicit wishes to family members or the attending physician. This includes being without an advanced directive document. Less common is the involuntary category. A well-known and recent example arose from the extreme circumstances in New Orleans following Hurricane Katrina. The hospital was without water, sanitation, and electricity, no longer habitable, and there was no way to evacuate the most seriously ill patients. The physician in charge, Dr. Anna Po, administered doses of sedatives that brought death to four critically ill patients who would have otherwise died slowly and painfully, possibly by drowning. As a result, the physician and two nurses were charged with second-degree murder. However, the grand jury declined to indict Dr. Poe and the nurses. Dr. Poe was acquitted of mercy killings because she was acting under necessity. This does not mean that we have legalized active involuntary euthanasia as a matter of practice, but it does indicate a problem with quote, exceptionalist prohibitions, unquote. According to my colleague and bioethicist, Dr. Courtney Campbell, many Christian theologians have been willing to allow for emergency case euthanasia. Finally, philosopher James Rachels argues that the distinction between active and passive euthanasia itself does not serve us well for a couple of reasons. First, passive and euthanasia, letting die, letting nature take its course, can be more cruel and less compassionate than active euthanasia, killing. An example might be when a death is long, drawn out, and painful. For example, and here Dr. Werno and I were on exactly the same page, uh, for a patient with ALS or Lou Gehrig's disease, or like my father's death, with which I began. A second reason Rachel's claims there is little meaningful moral distinction between letting die and killing is that whether we kill someone for personal gain 
or stand by to watch the person die a needless death, also for personal gains, our actions are equivalently immoral. Rachels argues that there are two implications from the equivalence thesis. First, cases where passive euthanasia would be permissible would also be cases where active euthanasia would be also permissible. And secondly, and this one I think is more uh, troubling, situations where we let people die, for example, those starving to death as we speak tonight in areas of famine, are morally equivalent to our killing them. Leaving aside for now the subtle and arguable distinctions, I'm going to address euthanasia, and here is my def the area of euthanasia I want to defend tonight. Self-chosen hastening of dying under conditions of terminal illness and imminent death. I want to raise two issues this evening to complicate what some people think is a subtle issue. First of all, how does the terminal sedation differ from active euthanasia? And second of all, whose life is it anyway? Question of terminal sedation. It, terminal sedation is the name given to the practice of administering medications at the end of life to keep the dying patient comfortable until death. It is the decision to keep dying patients who cannot be made comfortable in any other way unconscious until they die. It is a practice that is only used in the final stages of life when nutrition or antibiotics or other medical interventions can do nothing to prolong life. The kinds of conditions that are treated with terminal sedation include cancer that is metastasized to the spine and intolerable shortness of breath resulting from chronic obstructive lung disease, such as my father's condition. There are other such conditions, and they are found in about 15 to 50 percent of terminally ill patients. With such intolerable suffering, adequate relief can only be obtained by sedating the patient, patient often deeply. Such drug-induced sedation is legal in most countries, including in the United States, and it is a widely accepted mainstay of end-of-life care. Terminal sedation has been legally sanctioned in the United States since 1997 when the Supreme Court outlawed euthanasia and explicitly ruled terminal sedation legal under the Constitution. Dr. Porter Story, Executive Vice President of the American Academy of Hospice and, Hospice and Palliative Medicine, says that choosing to resort to terminal sedation is often a relief both for the patients and for their families. It relieves patients of their fear of dying or not getting adequate help at the end of life. As mentioned earlier, administered pain medication and anti-anxiety drugs often depress respirations. As second, third, and fourth doses and more are administered, the depressed respirations also slow down the metabolism of each successive dosage. Eventually, the patient's respirations cease, the heart stops beating, and death occurs. The sedation is maintained until the patient dies. Usually within a few days, in most cases, terminal sedation shortens the patient's life by hours to days. Terminal sedation is regularly practiced. Estimates range of up to 50% of the time in hospice care. In fact, one reason for Oregon's Death with Dignity Act is to provide a legal framework and transparency to procedures that were happening anyway. It is also approved by many Christian denominations, including the Catholic Church. This is because of reliance on the doctrine of double effect in terminal sedation. In brief, the doctrine of double effect says that if one does a particular act that is deemed good, such as bombing a munitions factory in a residential neighborhood, even though one can reasonably foresee that there will be unavoidable civilian deaths, one is not morally responsible for these civilian deaths since one has not intended them, even though one has caused them. The civilian deaths are a side effect of the intended bombing and removal of the munitions factory. This principle of double effect comes from Thomas Aquinas' consideration of self-defense resulting in the death of the attacker. One intends to defend oneself and in the process kills another person. It is foreseeable that the attacker will be killed or may be killed if we take certain actions. However, if we are not morally responsible, however, we are not morally responsible because the death was not intended. We only intended to defend ourselves. It is fairly clear how this doctrine of double effect plays out in the kinds of medical conditions, conditions we're examining this evening. 
It is permissible to administer doses of medication which can be foreseen to cause the patient's death as long as one does not intend the patient's death and intends only to relieve the patient's suffering. The deaths of the civilians, the homicidal attacker, and the patient are considered side effects to the intended good acts by this doctrine. Christian, mostly Catholic ethicists, believe that the doctrine of double effect results in actions morally different from deliberate euthanasia for the relief of pain. Although terminal sedation is consistent with accepted medical practices, such as aggressively treating pain and suffering, some opponents think that it is tantamount to slow euthanasia. My question is just how terminal sedation differs from active euthanasia in terms of real world effects where the rubber meets the road. The central difference is the denial of moral responsibility for effects that one can clearly anticipate but does not intend in terminal sedation. Otherwise, in actions and in effects, terminal sedation and active euthanasia are indistinguishable. Contrary to the doctrine of double effect, it is my view that we should take moral responsibility for whatever we can foresee as resulting from our actions. Let me give an example that has arisen in my many years of teaching about the immorality of racism, sexism, and the other forms of oppression found in our society. I have learned that most students from the dominant culture are unaware that often the things we say and do are racist or sexist or otherwise demeaning to some specific members of our communities. Last year's blackout razor situation, the hanging of a witch from a tree, the Halloween costumes this year of illegal aliens, and the like are recent examples. These incidents are too numerous to mention. Many people, when confronted with the hurtfulness of their behavior, respond by saying, but I didn't mean any harm. My response to the claim when someone says, I didn't mean to cause harm, is a really a quite simple question. If we do not intend harm, does this mean no harm is done? I think the answer to that is clearly no. Philip Halley, a 20th century philosopher who taught at Wesleyan University for his whole career, wrote an article called The Evil That Men Think and Do about our propensity to focus all of our attention on the mental states of the agent, the wrongdoer. Instead, he urges us to look to the effects of our actions first in evaluating the morality of our actions because I believe that we should take responsibility for causing pain and harm to others, intended or not. I also believe that whatever we can reasonably foresee is occurring as a result of our actions, we are also morally responsible for. Because of this, the doctrine of double effect is not convincing, and therefore it is my view that terminal sedation is indistinguishable from euthanasia as I have defined it. I have no doubt but what there are objections to my collapsing terminal sedation into euthanasia defined as self-chosen hastening of dying under conditions of terminal illness and imminent death. We will have an opportunity to discuss this and other ideas about which there is disagreement. I want to turn now to my second question. Whose life is it anyway? Most objections to euthanasia rest on deeply held religious beliefs, namely that one's life is a gift from God and only God ought to be able to choose to end it. Not only do I have no objection to a personally held belief such as this, I myself honor the range of religious beliefs in our communities. On the basis of such a personal religious belief, I also believe that no one should be required to undertake terminal sedation if she chooses otherwise. In other words, there is no role whatsoever for coercion in what otherwise may appear to be freely chosen hastening of death. By the very same token, no one should be deprived of this option under the circumstances outlined. Just as I can fully defend a person's belief that their life belongs to God, however the person defines the creator for herself or himself, I personally believe that this life I am living is my life, and thus it is up to me if I choose a form of terminal sedation under certain conditions, all other things being equal. It is my view that to seek to forbid others to do as they see fit with their own lives within the context of their religious or spiritual lives is hubris, both directions. In the end, this is one of those differences in belief that cannot be argued away, 
and the argument has to end somewhere, to quote Wittgenstein. To